Welcome to the Veterinary Project Podcast, episode 146. Welcome to the show created by vets featuring absolutely no pets. This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, hosted by Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Our resident veterinarians have swapped out their stethoscopes in favor of microphones to bring you the Veterinary Project Podcast, a show focused on real conversations aimed to connect this amazing profession full of remarkable people. Through the sharing of collective stories and wisdom and connecting over the many unique challenges we face, we invite you to join our community of veterinary professionals leading intentional lives. And now, here are the hosts of the Veterinary Project Podcast, Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Welcome back to the Veterinary Project Podcast, Dr. Michael Bug, Dr. Jonathan Light. What is happening, Dr. Bug? Well, pretty proud dad last night putting Riley to bed. She's like, hey, lay beside me, dad, and tell me everything about cats. So she's on a real big kick with cats right now, which I really like because I love cats. So she's been asking for one. So we'll see if we end up with a cat in the household soon. Amazing. Our cats, well, we had two cats. Now we're down to one cat. And my kids really didn't have a lot to do with them for the first few years of life. But now, even this morning, Jack loves going into this one area where the heater is in the morning and the cat plops herself right down beside him and he'll give her a good scratch every morning now. And it's just awesome to see them really interacting now and the cat not being scared of my kids for potentially stepping on them in every which way possible. It's pretty cool to see. Yeah. Yeah. Candace wants a dog in a bad way though. So I'm going to hold out on that one for a while longer. So interesting how that happens. Today's episode, excited about this one. It's a difficult one, but it's an important one again in veterinary medicine that I don't know. I've never listened to this being talked about on any other podcast. So happy to have our good friend and expert communicator with us, Dr. Jordan Woodsworth again today. Yeah. I mean, it was a good one. I think it's a very valid topic, you know, dealing with medical mistakes, communicating through medical mistakes. One of the biggest things I learned in practice is I kind of had this idea, I guess, where if you make a mistake, the relationship with that client is over. You know, I had that in my head where, you know, if you mess up, they're gone. How it turned out to be and what my experience was is sometimes these are just incredible relationship building opportunities. And off of that medical mistake comes a really long and deeply respectful client relationship. That was mostly my experience. You do have a few clients that they go a different way after something happens, but there is a lot of clients that really appreciate like how you deal with the medical error really sets the tone. Absolutely. And that's basically the focus of today's conversation is how do we deal with a medical error and some really nice practical tips, some discussions and an acronym to use in practice when a medical error occurs and not if one occurs. So no matter the place that you are in in your career, this is an eventuality. And so we really dive deep into how we can look after ourselves, look after those around us and really effectively communicate when one does happen. So we're going to keep this tight today. As always, exciting to have Dr. Jordan Woodworth join us. I'm skipping her bio. We've told her bio six times before. We'll provide that in the notes. She's amazing. Please enjoy this conversation with Dr. Jordan Woodsworth. Dr. Jordan Woodsworth, welcome back to the program, otherwise known as the Veterinary Project Podcast, in-house resident communication expert, friend of the program. Thanks for joining us. Happy to be here as always. Very exciting. Episode number what? 100 and something. We're in the 140s somewhere at this point. Amazing. It's amazing. After number 70, you start to lose track of time. And with age, and we were just talking about this pre-recording, it also becomes more of a blur. Yep, yes. for sure. And Jordan, you just committed a huge podcasting faux pas. Oh, because I'm tr- I'm trying to place you in time and you yeah, can't do that? You can't do that. You can't. Us professional podcasters would never do that. Listen, you'll notice that in the intro, Johnny didn't call me a podcasting expert. Okay. I mean, I feel like if once you're on 10 more times, then you get that badge <laughs> or that. Okay, I'll I mean, be waiting. Is number seven or number eight. We've already lost half our listeners again. 
Classic us banter, man. That just pisses Mike off so much. Oh, I hate when Johnny says that. Today's conversation, we're full of energy today. I'll put us in time. It's a Friday afternoon. We haven't seen each other for a couple of weeks. We are talking a serious topic today. For those, though, that haven't had the opportunity to listen to one of your many episodes joining us, tell us a little bit about yourself, Jordan, and why, for this topic in particular today, we're all in the same room chatting. So I'm a 2008 grad from the WCVM. Mike and I graduated together. I was in private practice for a few years, and then I started working at the Vet College in 2012. And so as part of my work there, I was in about 2016, I was trained as a clinical communications facilitator through the Institute for Healthcare Communications. And I am a self-professed communications nerd as a result of that. I've always thought that communication is a little bit of the sort of magic and the art of veterinary medicine and sort of the part of it that makes us really successful in our work, especially with clients, but also within our teams. So for me, it's always really exciting to work with people to help them grow their communication kind of toolbox and figure out different ways that they can use these little hints and tips and tricks to make our lives as veterinarians easier. I think a lot of the fatigue that we sometimes feel in practice has to do with our challenges around communicating, especially with difficult topics. That's why today is such a good one, because we're going to talk about medical mistakes and communication around those. The inevitability of these happening to us always when we're in practice, how we can manage them to both relieve ourselves of some distress and also maintain and repair relationships with our clients. Fantastic. And I think across the breadth of our podcast listeners, that toolbox that you relate to at the start and discussing communication, that's where I think this is going to come into order today. Because as you described, medical errors in veterinary medicine, they abound and they are going to happen. You, if you're a new veterinary student just coming into the profession, get ready for it. It is a reality of our profession and how we handle those both in communication internally and externally to those that are involved makes a huge difference in our mental well-being. And again, I'm speaking firsthand here and be able to relate experiences that have occurred in my own professional development through the years. Yeah, so really excited. We've wanted to have this topic on for a while and provide as much practical knowledge, tips, tricks, et cetera. So thank you for the intro, Jordan. A place to start with, though, from a practicality standpoint and preparing for this recording today, a brief quote from the human end, the AMA Journal of Medical Ethics. Medical errors are the eighth leading cause of death in the U.S. Medication errors alone cause more than 7,000 human deaths per year. Yep. It's a staggering factor, staggering figure. Absolutely. This has been researched in the veterinary end too, not to the degree of looking at the number of errors because it's not something where we have as a regulatory body or body stated that as a standard practice, we need to report them. That's um, right. I wonder, Jordan, from your time within the WCBM, Western College of Veterinary Medicine, and working with colleagues and then students, how you approach this topic because it's an important one and it's real life. Yeah, I think that's a really important question. When you talk about the contribution of medical errors to human death on the human medical side, not to get dark, but I think we can also relate this back to some of the challenges we experience with mental health on the veterinary side too. And again, just to reiterate what I said in the opening, I think that's part of the reason why it's so important for us to talk about this and get good at having these tools and figuring out how to navigate these conversations so that it doesn't weigh on us as heavily as it might otherwise. For me, especially, you know, when I've had the chance to talk with students or with interns and residents about this topic, I think it's so important to normalize medical errors because as you said, it's going to happen. If we're in practice for more than about five years, chances are good that we've encountered and been a part of at least one medical error with our team. I think the thing to remember as well is that, you know, the communication stuff, we're not just talking about how we're communicating with clients. We're also talking about the communication within our teams. Some of that can actually be preventive when it comes to medical errors. And I think we've talked about that back when we discussed core communication skills and things like that, but also that how we navigate through conversation, through dialogue after a medical mistake, I think it can inform what happens with our teams moving forward. So, you know, when there isn't good communication, good dialogue, good team approach after these sorts of instances, that's when we see things like workplace turnover and absenteeism and a whole bunch of other things that are problematic for us that don't directly have to do with the patient. patient. I think that we have to remember that we all make mistakes. And I think we have this real culture of perfectionism. You guys have covered this so many times on your podcast, right? Having this culture of perfectionism within veterinary medicine. And so we have this 
silly expectation and unrealistic expectation of ourselves that we're going to be able to bat a thousand all the time. I know nothing about baseball, so I have no idea why I use that reference. You nailed it. You nailed it. <laughs> But reality is we're never going to be able to be perfect. And the more cases we see, the more likely we are to encounter a medical error. But again, I think the important thing to remember is knowing that that's going to happen, it's critical for us to remember that the severity of the outcomes with our clients and therefore how we feel about ourselves and our teams and our abilities and all of those things afterwards those don't rely on us being perfect and never making mistakes. That's not the key here. The key is how to do that communication. So for me, this is empowering. And this is what's so magical, I think, about communication is that it kind of can relieve us a little bit of all of that internalized pressure and sometimes external pressure to be perfect, to do, always do the right thing, to never make a mistake. And instead, we acknowledge that it's going to happen. And when it does, here are the ways that we can do a good job. Excellent. Wow, love to dive into there. And, and one of the things I heard in that empowerment, it actually had nothing to do with the medical error itself. It had nothing to do with the outcome of the medical error for that patient and or that client. It had to do more internally and in where we start that communication, both to ourselves and then to our team and clients, et cetera. Am I correct in that assumption? Absolutely. Last time when we were together, we talked about sort of some big takeaways, especially for people who are new to practicing. And I think that's the biggest one, right? Like, don't don't try and be so rigid that you're never, ever going to make a mistake because it's not possible. Relieve yourself of the bitter thoughts for us. And then when you get there, here are some tools that you have, right? So I think that that's very, very important. Excellent. Self-acceptance of the fact it's going to happen. So I wonder how we take this episode to practical. I wonder if we use an experience as an example and then walk through some steps. We had talked about this in the pre-recording. Dr. Lauren Forsythe, she provided an article July 2018 from the Veterinary Idealist blog, and she provided a number of very practical steps to take as a veterinary professional, both internally communicating and then working through the error that will happen. Perhaps we walk through that and then talk about some of the internal and external factors that come in. How does that sound? Yep, sounds great to me. Well, I'm going to put myself on the spot here because in first year practice, I did make a medical error and it's one that I'm going to remember. And it's one that I felt really bad and I still do for sure. But then looking back on it, I was going, hey, this was going to eventually happen. I was working in an emergency at the time and I had a cat that came in, had some bleeding and it was frank blood and I was coming from the upper GI. We ended up working it, diagnosing it. And my treatment, unfortunately, had an NSAID that went on board. And I won't mention the NSAID. And I ended up leading to some duodenal ulcerations and the cat ended up passing and I can frame and I can even feel it right now as I discuss this case I can feel the redness I can feel the emotion because it was something that at the time we were extremely busy you're seeing lots of caseloads I shouldn't have made that error I shouldn't have used an NSAID in a case with an animal that was already bleeding and we didn't know the direct cause from but I did it it happened and we had a very unfortunate result for this case I'm brand new graduate don't really know what to do. I've not been trained in what to do other than I've got to have a discussion with the owner. I've got to let my bosses know. I have no other sense of what's next. Let's walk through what should have happened in that situation. So I would bet, especially given what you talked about in terms of feeling those emotions right now, that you felt a lot of shame and guilt at the time. Can confirm, having made medical mistakes myself, that's what tends to happen. And so I think first step is to take a deep breath because we tend to get all up in our heads immediately and start berating ourselves mentally. And as you said, thinking about, okay, I shouldn't have done that. Why did I do that? Why am I so stupid, right? All those things that we do to ourselves with that perfectionist lens and in that perfectionist culture. So I think obviously, you know, in your situation, that patient died. And I think in a situation where say we've got a patient in front of us and something has happened, the first step is obviously to tend to the patient's needs. That's always step number one. But the next thing is when we're getting ready to talk to a client and let them know about what's gone on, we've got to gather ourselves emotionally and mentally, and we have to put information together. So that might mean that we look through our records, we write down what it was that happened, and we talk to our teammates if other people were involved in, you know, in steps that we weren't a part of. And then I think- So do you do, I'm going to jump into practicals and now working through these a number of times a year, because it does happen. It happens, you have a number of practices, this does happen two to three times a year. Does that happen right away at the time? Obviously, we need to stabilize that patient. We need to look 
look after that patient. We need to treat that patient. But then that fact finding and that information gathering, are we doing it right away? Are we doing it the next day? Again, I, I want to make this as practical for people as possible, or does yeah. it vary? I think that'll depend on the urgency of the situation, right? But always before we talk to a client, especially when we're sharing bad news of some description, we want to make sure we have as much information as possible that we can share with them because they're going to have questions. And so we need to make sure that we have as complete a picture as we possibly can. And where we're missing information, we have to get practiced at telling people that. And we'll talk about some of the words that we can use in a minute. But I think it's important to recognize also that once we've collected the information, we can just take a second to figure out where we are, again, emotionally and mentally. Because chances are good, we're going to be elevated, we're going to be really stressed, pretty anxious about talking to, you know, whether it's our supervisors and or the client, we have to be thinking about, okay, I've got all these feelings, I know that those are there. And really consciously thinking about, okay, we got to set those aside for now, because there are the things we need to take care of, but I deserve support. And so making it a priority to ensure that there's some sort of support and time set aside to deal with our own feelings about the situation. It sounds silly, right? It sounds very kind of touchy feely, but it's so critical. And again, you know, we talk about mental health in the veterinary profession all the time. So we have to be really intentional about taking care of our mental health, particularly when really challenging things happen. As far as preparation for that client conversation, I think people have to get comfortable with doing a little bit of rehearsal. It is okay to stand in the mirror in the bathroom, lock the door and just stare at yourself and say the words you're going to say to the client for five minutes before you call them. Because again, I think that we can have so much anxiety and so much activation in our bodies that it can sometimes be really tricky to do that on the spot unless we're well practiced at it. It's okay to do that little bit of rehearsal or even write down some notes for yourself about what you might say. We also, you know, have to recognize that clients are going to have feelings about it, right? So to prepare a little bit for that. Sorry, can I jump yeah. in real quick? Because it slides in just in front of that, a slight tangent. When do you make contact? So here's a hypothetical example. We'll say we had a big medical mistake during the business day and a patient has passed away in our hospital and the client is off doing their thing. You want to take some time, gather your thoughts, but when do you reach out? Because I'm thinking of situations where, you know, it's nearing the end of the day and maybe you haven't reached out yet and the client is early yeah. and they're expecting to pick up their pet. And I know if they initiate the contact and say, Hey, how's my pet doing? And then you have to be like, Oh, actually yeah. this happened. It's received completely differently than if you make the outreach and say, Hey, I've got some bad news. So That's how right. do you balance that of being prepared? So you got to take some time, gather the data, calm yourself down, but don't delay Yes. So how do you balance that? If I don't know if there's a question in there, but I want to speak to that because that changes the conversation. You're absolutely right. So I think it's critical that we're very timely with this, right? And particularly if it is a catastrophic medical error, let's say, right? So, you know, in the event that a patient dies, let's say, I think that as soon as we possibly can, we call that client. Now, the question often is, do you have that conversation over the phone? Or do you invite them to come and have that conversation in person? And how do you do that? If I had to think of a timeline, let's say you're doing a surgery and patient dies on the table, right? You have an anesthetic death. I would think that it would be perfectly reasonable to take half an hour to do your preparation, to do your information gathering, to rehearse your script, and then call your client. For something that's that big, if you've waited much longer than half an hour, that's probably too long. That will put a little bit more pressure on us because of the urgency of it. But I think like you mentioned, Mike, if we end up in a situation where a client makes contact with us first, and then we have to disclose bad news, that's a real problem. And the way that the client perceives that and takes it in is going to be different from if we take the initiative to make the contact. I would make the comments, and I think we'll get into this right away in terms of on the phone versus in person. I think both are valid options. And yeah. as being the leader in hospitals, whether it's a manager or Rod, now CEO, both of those options come into play. Yeah. In the case of an anesthetic death, where that timeline is so short, in my view, that is picking up the phone and being ready with the facts that are prevalent and not beating around the bush. 
meaning yep. being direct, empathetic, and providing the facts that are in that case that's arrived, and then open it up for the conversation and allowing for that time in person. But again, I'm not taking your thunder. You tell us what's proper. I think one of the things to also take into consideration when we're doing that, right, if we are making contact by phone with clients, is we have to think about the client's safety and well-being at the same time. So if you know that due to the relationship between the client and the patient, that it's going to hit extremely hard for that client to hear what you have to say over the phone, and you're maybe a little bit worried about how they might respond or whether they'll be safe driving to the clinic or you know any of those things, then I might suggest that you call them up, let them know that you have a hard conversation to have with them, right? So Mrs. Smith, I have some difficult news to share with you. It's really important that I do this in person. Could you come down to the clinic as soon as possible? If you can bring a support person with you, that'd be great. Because again, people are going to be worried automatically when you give them that information. But I think that we don't want to, especially if we know that clients might have an extremely tough time with it, we want to let them know there's something that they need to hear, but we don't want to necessarily put them in danger if we think that that might be a risk for them. So yeah, I think you're right. I think that we can do that over the phone, but we just have to be a little bit selective about when and how that happens. After that, I think that, you know, once we get started, and, and I think even in person, we kind of do that little bit of a, a warning, a setup, right? Like, I'm, I'm really sorry, I have some difficult news to share with you. And you got to use the right tone of voice, right? Like we're not doing this with a smile on our faces and a peppy body energy, right? We're doing this with the kind of gravity that it deserves. Then there's this acronym that, again, I mentioned the Institute for Healthcare Communications that their training modules offer that I think is helpful. I like these acronyms because they give us a bit of a back pocket strategy and they're helpful. They're really easy to remember, things like that. So this one is TEAM. So when you're disclosing medical mistakes, TEAM is the acronym. The T stands for truth. So you have to be truthful and transparent with these situations. Oftentimes, especially if we've got a heavy layer of shame on us around what happened and we were directly responsible for what it was that went on, we can try and sugarcoat stuff sometimes and sort of gloss over what actually happened. But that's where we're going to dig ourselves into a bit of a hole. This is why gathering information and writing things down in advance is really critical because then we can really be clear about how we're describing this to clients. And this is another important place to not use jargon. We have to be very plain and concise and clear with our language for people. I have some difficult news. I'm sorry to have to tell you that when we were doing this surgery, Fluffy reacted poorly to the anesthetic. Her heart stopped. We were unable to revive her and she has died. And use that very plain language. We have to get away from using euphemisms for death because I think that can be misunderstood. And sometimes people at that point are going to be so flooded, they can't hear anymore. You have to read the room a little and think about, you know, okay, are they ready to hear the next thing? And then we ask permission for that. So would it help if I explain further what happened, right? Sorry, just to jump in, one thing I yeah. noticed, like you talked about tone of voice, but your speed of delivery, like everything slowed down and softened. Yeah. With them. Yeah. And you have to, because again, this is something that we don't want to rapid fire for people because their nervous systems are going to automatically be jacked right up as soon as we say we've got bad news and their pet's not in the room. So we want to make sure that as much as possible, we're delivering things in a way that's going to be absorbed. And we also are going to set the tone for the energy in the room a little bit. If we're making sure that our own nervous systems are calmed down as much as possible, and we're taking a beat and really being intentional with how clear and concise and slow we're being with talking to the client, that will help a lot. And sorry, I keep sending us on tangents. Do you anything other than remembering to breathe? Because a lot of people, if you're very stressed, very anxious, very nervous, will speed up. Yeah, like that's the tendency. I'm nervous. I talk faster and faster and faster. Yep. So how do we like as the veterinarian delivering the bad news, having all of our own emotions kind of welling up? How do we just slow it down? Practice, practice, practice. It's so important. I tell students all the time if we're going into an appointment and they're nervous or say we've got like a student who's like a cattle person and they're going into an appointment with a cat and they're freaked right out. Take a second before you walk into that room and like ground yourself. Again, this is language that we're not accustomed to in veterinary medicine, really, but literally feel your feet on the ground and take the deepest breath that you possibly can and let it go. And that alone will kind of set your nervous system up 
to settle a little bit. Those are really critical tools. There are lots of others. And I mean, our social worker at the college is really the person to talk about these things because she's got a lot of experience with somatic therapies, but even things like checking out what's in the room around you, right? So orienting yourself to the things around the room, sometimes that can really calm us down. But physically sitting, like sit your butt on the ground, on the chair, on the table, whatever you're going to do, put your hands on your legs, right? Just so that you can actually be in your body a little bit instead of spinning up in our heads. Because I think that's where we tend to get so much more elevated and activated is when we're not actually physically present. We are all up here and freaking out. So you've delivered the news, you've read the room, You've asked for permission for more. What's next in this acronym, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. So still within the T, if the client says, yes, I would like all the information you have, right? Or something to that effect. You got to start with what happened. Be really clear about what that is, how it happened, and then what's next for the patient. In my memorable medical error example, I was eight and a half months pregnant with my son, and I was doing a dental on a dachshund who had been in a puppy mill, had tons of tooth root abscesses. I had mentioned to the client that there was the possibility that we might have a really fragile mandible as a result. That was the case. And when I went in to remove a mandibular canine tooth, and I, again, I had given the clients that information that, that was a risk of the procedure and they had still given consent. It was still an error, right? And I still felt awful about it. In that sort of situation where the patient is still alive and it's still our responsibility to do something about that patient's health, then we have to describe what's going to be next for them. And then it's so critical, the E part of team, empathy, empathy, empathy. So we've talked about this in like every single communications episode we've done thus far is how critical empathy is and how it is like the tool that will get us to move forwards with our dialogue with clients and within our teams as well and our families, right, Mike? To be able to empathize with people's experiences because we all know how we'd feel if we were in their shoes. Telling them all the things that happened and then taking a beat. Silence is really valuable. And then something like, I imagine you might have a lot of questions for me and you probably have some feelings. And before I go on, I'd like to hear from you. And then give people the space. Some people are going to say, I don't want to talk about it right now. That's okay. We might not be their safe space or their safe person. If that's the case, we move on to A. If it isn't the case, I think we have to get really good at practicing depersonalizing people's anger, people's frustration. We can totally, again, imagine how people might be feeling in that type of scenario. So it's okay to validate those things. I can see how angry you are, and that makes total sense to me. I would be incredibly angry too. Go ahead, Mike. I can see you. Yeah, I want to. I want to jump in on this particular piece. Yeah. How do we? set a line if there is a line here because we talk a lot in veterinary medicine of boundaries right yep. and certainly we do not want clients abusing us right nope. and we, we should not tolerate that these situations and i'm not giving clients a free pass where it's like abuse away we screwed up but i mean we got to be realistic there's going to be anger yep and as veterinarians i've been in that room where it's like you're gonna take some shit in this conversation mm -hmm. and i guess i'll just say it about myself i told myself it's like well i kind of deserve it right now Yep. So how do we like toe that line of like, okay, client's going to get away with maybe more aggressive communication than we would typically tolerate because this is a very heightened situation. I don't know. I'm just throwing you in there. How do you navigate that? So I think we have to be able to recognize the difference between anger, which is a normal human emotion and abusive behavior, which is not cool. Because if people are expressing that they are angry, there's this whole thing about anger being a secondary emotion, right? So anger is usually based in other things like despair or fear or, you know, those types of things. And so we can recognize that anger is sometimes a go-to for people, even if underneath it, there's something else happening. We can allow people space to have their anger, but where it becomes not okay is if people start pointing their finger in your face, if they're getting into your personal bubble, if they're threatening, none of those things are okay, regardless of what the mistake might be. If people are just frustrated and they're saying, I don't know how this happened. I'm so angry or I just can't believe that this happened. How dare you kill my dog? Whatever it happens to be. Our piece of that interaction can be, we take a breath. We kind of feel out, do we feel safe with in this interaction or don't we? You know, it's very valid, again, to give people the space and the silence to express themselves. 
And then to say, you know, I hear you. This is extremely unexpected. It's very scary. It feels like something that we've done wrong. And I will say, here's where we, the A is apologize. I would like to say how sorry I am that this happened, that I or we made this mistake that led to this outcome that none of us were hoping for or expecting. We have so to claim responsibility. In, yeah. Well, let's jump into that one because I think that's a piece where I'm going to use this quote that also comes from the AMA. Physicians typically respond to errors with anger, shame, and fear. Mostly they fear a malpractice suit in which patients accuse them of medical negligence and substantive care in order to be compensated for economic losses. As a result of this fear, physicians may avoid or hide the error, become defensive, or blame others. In the yeah. long term, they can experience sadness, self-doubt, and guilt. This is a piece in veterinary medicine, and it's front and center. If I apologize, if I admit error, I'm at risk of being sued and or I'm going to be taken to the board and found guilty. Tell us your thoughts on that. So it's really fascinating because regardless of how we deal with things in the moment, if this goes to the regulatory association, the regulatory body, they're going to find out it was your fault anyway, right? Because your medical records are hopefully, from a legal standpoint, going to reflect that. What we know is that a lot of the lawsuits that we're scared of, a lot of this litigation and reporting and things like that that we're scared of can be avoided if we do a good job with our communication. So if we are centering the relationship with our clients, within our teams, during our communication around medical mistakes, we're much less likely to face litigation or medical board complaints. So as you mentioned, it's, it's go ahead. Cannot overstate how important your last minute's worth of conversation. It is everything in terms of the communication to the client, the acknowledgement, the empathy, and the apology. And Absolutely. without a doubt, I will have been sued on behalf of the organizations I've worked at a lot more by not having admitted and tried to hide things. Yes, or, for sure. But yeah, people absolutely. still to this day will phone me and say, should I say something? Like, we're already past that point. Get to it and then walk through all the acronym that you've provided for any vet student coming out. I hope this is the key part of this discussion. Yeah. I'm sorry for break, but it's just so key. It is. You're absolutely right. And so that tendency to kind of deflect, all of that has to do with the stuff that, again, you guys have covered in your podcast many times is that our identities are so wrapped up in being a veterinarian and as a result of that being perfect, not ever being found out to not be perfect, right? That imposter syndrome piece that we tend to do the deflection. And especially if there's someone else in our team who might've been involved, some of us might have the tendency to throw them under the bus, which is totally inappropriate. So we need to remember that don't deflect, don't cover things up, really be clear and transparent about taking responsibility and then also potentially providing clients support where it's possible and where you think it's necessary. So to follow up, Johnny, on what you said was so critical, the piece that I have taken away from this, like when I was first learning about these things, is that even in cases that do go to court where there have been medical mistakes, clinicians are favored when they've shown appropriate concern, interest, and compassion when mistakes are made. So even Absolutely. if we end up in court, if we've done a good job of centering our relationship with our client and the patient and being human about it, we're more likely to have an outcome that feels okay for us. And why is that? Because the technical version of us going to the board is how is our activity in judgment to those of our peers? So okay. what would peers in the exact same situation in the ideal do? And you nailed it. We would hope that we would follow through to this degree of what we're discussing today. Absolutely. Yeah. That kind of takes us to the M part of team, which is to now manage through to, to whatever the resolution is of this case, right? So we got to do that management after we've done the disclosure, after we've empathized, after we've apologized. And so then we have to figure out where the accountability piece and the follow-up piece comes. There are tons of different philosophies on this, and every practice is going to be a little bit different in terms of what the process is. You know, in some cases, you might choose to waive the fees or a part of the fees. Maybe there's covering the cost of follow-up care if there's a bunch of follow-up care that wouldn't have otherwise been necessary. I think it's important to remember that we got to probably talk to our liability insurance issuers before we go ahead and do those things, just so that we know. And again, that's a practice job to do that unless you're self-employed. But I think certainly figuring out some way to make repairs with the client is really critical. Sometimes the tendency can be to go to money. That's not always what people care about. And that can actually kind of be offensive because some people, there's no value that can be placed on their animal's health and well-being. To automatically go to money is going to be a problem. So sometimes you say, what else can we do to make sure that we're 
taking this to a place of resolution with you. And then giving them the time. I have also found that the first conversation actually is often not what transpires in the second conversation once some time has elapsed. Yes, absolutely. And that's actually my next point was that sometimes this requires a few meetings, right? And the other piece of the puzzle too, is that sometimes that's not just all on us either. We also have to think about that we can often phone a friend, right? Johnny, for you in your position now, right, I would imagine that you get called into some of these meetings quite frequently to sort of manage and facilitate and do all of that, right? For individual veterinarians and definitely for new graduates where sometimes we can feel like everything's our responsibility all of a sudden, I think it's important to remember that there's always a safety net, right? There's always someone else that you can call in to provide some support. It doesn't mean that they take responsibility and they take all the stuff away from you, but just that there's someone else there to provide information, fill in some gaps, because you're also going to be experiencing some distress, especially in the short term. Absolutely. And it's good when you're coming in with an employer to have that discussion off the start. That's another yeah. communication piece is if you can have a discussion at the start of your employment with that individual, with that clinic, with that group, hey, what do we do when things go bad? Because sometimes yeah. they will. I'm not sure because I've never heard the team's acronym. A couple of pieces I want to jump on is Depending on the clinic, depending on the culture, depending on the size, a medical error occurs in the hospital and it spreads like wildfire. Mm -hmm. I cannot believe how fast the gossip train will run in certain places and having unfortunately been a part of these. Tell us about what that looks like from your perspective for communicating out to the rest of the team. Well, like you said, I think it's different in every hospital. I have always loved the idea of M&M rounds, right? Morbidity and mortality rounds, or really we could call them medical mistakes rounds, because that gives an opportunity to normalize this stuff, particularly when people from all different levels of experience in the hospital and all different positions participate in those conversations. I work in academia, so it's a little bit different, but in a private practice setting, I could see this being a once a month lunch and learn topic where everybody gets together. We collect the things that have either been really challenging for us over the last month that we want to kind of bounce off of our teammates or that we felt didn't go as well as they could have or actual medical or communication errors. And we work through those as a team because I think what we don't want to happen is we don't want there to be this culture of, did you hear what she did? Like she really screwed up, you know? And that's sometimes what happens with that rumor mill situation. And so if we can bring the elephant into the open and talk about it and really build that culture of, hey, this is normal we all screw up. And here are some ways that we provide support to each other when it happens, because we don't want people to feel as though they're isolated when that does occur. That's, and then I know in our world, what we do in that in non academic setting is might be the day after it might be the hour after is a huddle together and, and yes. get a huddle going. And no matter the size of hospital, you can do that. And I've worked in hospitals of 70 or in hospitals of five, yep. having that communication, that transparency, here's what's occurred. Here's the steps we're taking. And here's the next steps in the follow-up. I think people are also looking for that. And yeah. I, you can tangibly feel the emotions come down once it's just put on a plate and shared. Yep. Transparency is important across the board within the team and with our clients, because when we don't do that, that's when people start to feel as though there's people are talking about them and fingers are being pointed and they've done something horrible that no one else has ever done before in the history of veterinary medicine, all of those sorts of things. So absolutely. And because there are other folks in the team who are going to be talking to the client too, if in that short period of time after the event, everybody's informed about what's gone on and then also what the expectations are around interfacing with the client afterwards or other clients. I think that things go a lot more smoothly because when there's that disconnect between what the veterinarian is saying, what the practice manager is saying, what the receptionist is saying, what the tech is saying, that's when if I were a client, I'd be like, okay, do you guys even know what you're doing? And they know it. They can see it. Oh, yeah. I want to jump in. I'm sorry. I don't want to, I'm going to throw us on a bit of a tangent because we've been speaking what? a lot of like medical errors and the way we've been speaking about them is big ones. Someone dies, something is broken. And we've talked about like, if you've been out five years or however long, the other side of that coin is I'll make an argument that medical errors happen almost every day, maybe not every day, but every week, yep. they're just super minor. And it's like, oh, that one didn't matter. You know, whether it's a drug with a wide dosing range and we miscalculated, but no big deal. Cause we're still not mm -hmm. going to cause a big problem. What do we do with like, is there an opportunity to like practice teams on the small stuff that really didn't matter versus, you know, are we just sort of micromanaging, right? Because I'm looking at this from both sides, like you want a vet hospital 
to have high standards, but you don't want people to feel like they're being micromanaged and criticized. Where's the fine line in here for all these little minor errors that happen? You don't want them to run amok. I don't know. I just want to throw that at you and see what you say. I think that's a great point. And I mean, working in an academic institution, medical errors happen all the time because people are learning and they're going to make mistakes. That's just the way that it is. I think that so an example might be something simple, but still that you have to communicate about, such as you gave a modified live Bordetella vaccine sub Q instead of in the nose or in the mouth. We've certainly had that situation, especially when we're up north, lots of cooks in the kitchen, huge volume, things are going to happen. I could write a book <laughs> on the things that we've encountered in those environments. But yeah, I think with that type of situation, you can use the same approach. In that situation, I think it was a student who actually gave the injection. And so they immediately told the closest veterinarian who was working with them. That veterinarian got as much information as they could. So where was it injected? When, you know, all of those sorts of things, did you record it in the file? And then told me as the vet of record. And then one of us, I can't remember if it was the responding veterinarian or myself who ended up making contact with that client, phoned them, said, just wanted to let you know, everything's going great here. We just had a small mistake that I wanted to let you know about. Here's what happened. This is what it means, right? Yeah, we're not supposed to give that <laughs> sub Q. It says it right on the label. There's a few different reasons for it. Here's what we've done, right? So we flushed the site with sub Q fluids, blah, blah, blah. And then we sent the dog home with doxycycline and we paid for the doxycycline. And then here's what to expect. If you notice these things, please let us know. We will make arrangements to ensure that you have access to care because of course we're separated from the community afterwards. And those are what we're doing. You know, what questions do you have for us knowing that this has happened today? Boom, it's done. You've done team. You've gone through that acronym in like five minutes. And you've given clients the space to respond, ask questions. You've kind of told them what's going to happen moving forward, how you're going to manage the patient's health, ask them if there's anything else, you know, what else it is that you can do for them. Excellent. My answer is varied on this one, and it's dependent on the style of practice that we've been in, whether we're doing near-miss reporting, whether that's actual and in, in, in a process standpoint, and I've had that in some specialty hospitals I've worked with and led. And then other ones, we've done it as recordings within the medical record and shared as a team at our huddles and then at our monthly meetings without a doubt there's ones that are missed yeah I would that's just a for sure and I can think of ones even this month where we've had where you know the wrong prescription's gone out that's yeah. a medical error where you've got the wrong drugs that have gone up where you've got that again these happen in practice where you've had catheters that have blown overnight there's so many different opportunities for errors in our industry that doesn't make us bad people that doesn't make us bad clinicians are we following the rules that have been outlined today as opportunities to learn yeah so sure i think you made a really good point that we should emphasize too is document 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 <laughs> right everything has to go in your medical what record. Is that? We doc document? Okay. Document. Okay. <laughs> it, is the, it is the first thing that I will share with my clinicians when a medical error has occurred is what have you written? What is the communication? What is the exacts? I want to the T the quote that has been shared with the owners. And sometimes I'll have angry owners. Sometimes I'll have belligerent owners. So there's a whole gamut of responses that has to be in the medical record, all yep. of it. And again, Again, it's more time consuming, but it is to the benefit of both learning from being able to be internally responsible and then what we can share with our teams as a result of it. And I think that especially with something like an error, particularly if it's a large one, but even if it's a medium or small one, we have to imagine what might go on should this get reported to our regulatory body, right? And again, we should never be living our lives assuming that's going to happen because that's silly and takes a lot of energy and it's not worth it. But I think that if we don't have that in the back of our minds, then we miss stuff. And I'll tell you, in situations where there are board complaints, they go through a lot of detail, right? Because they want to, as you said, they want to make sure that we've really done our due diligence and that we have done everything possible to keep our patients, our clients, the public and the profession safe and with a good reputation for the profession as well. And so we have to be really clear and detailed in our description of what went on, including the communication aspect, like you mentioned. Well, Jordan, we are nearing the end of this communication session and a very important one we've had today. Anything that we have missed or that you would like to add from medical errors which occur in every veterinary medical practice? I think just kind of coming back to what we talked about in the beginning that medical mistakes will happen. It's an inevitability. It's important to remember that folks are far more accepting of those mistakes if 
we do a good job as veterinarians and staff at handling those situations. So really focusing on, again, the relationship and making sure that that's maintained while also taking care of ourselves and our teams, I think is the biggest picture at the end of all of this, the biggest take home, and just, again, normalizing the heck out of medical mistakes. Excellent. Well, Jordan, with that, we'll come to a close. As always, thank you for joining Mike and I on the Veterinary Project podcast. It's a blast. You bring so much value to both us individually and our listeners. So thank you. Always happy to be here. Thank you for having me again. Thank you for listening to the Veterinary Project Podcast. As a recap, on behalf of our hosts, the Veterinary Project Podcast will be releasing new episodes weekly. So be sure to tune in as we bring you more conversations aimed at helping you enjoy a life well lived. If you enjoyed what you heard on the show and you want to stay in the know, please like, love, and or subscribe to the podcast on the listening platform of your choosing, as we're available on all the usual suspects. If you know of others that may benefit from these conversations, we'd love it if you please share the show with them, as this will help us grow our community to reach more and more veterinary professionals. Speaking of which, if you are a veterinary professional and would like to get connected with more like-minded individuals who are joining us on this journey, please send an email to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com, and we'll invite you to be a part of our private Facebook group general feedback, requests for information, or perhaps requests to be a guest on the show can also be sent to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com. Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light, thank you for listening to the show, and we'll catch you again next week for another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Bye for now. Bye for now.